Good morning and welcome to Rise with Genesis Church. The prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 58 verse 12, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Our series now is Rebuild, Becoming a Community of Repair, where we're looking at the story of Nehemiah. And so I invite you to come into this time of worship with a heart ready to give yourself to repairing that which has been broken. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. The God our Son knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus, every war he wages he will win. I'm not backing down from any giants. I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. In the late 1990s, I was part of a leadership group that was reaching an unreached people group in northern Nigeria. They had a reputation of being hardened toward the gospel predominantly Muslim, and suspicious of Christians. And yet we were convinced that God called us to reach out to them through prayer and partnership. We entered a partnership with a local ministry of Nigerian nationals who had been working with them a long time. And as you might imagine, the work was challenging with very little progress to show for it. At the time, I was working with Youth with a Mission, an international, interdenominational mission organization that specialized in mobilizing young people to share the gospel throughout the world. I was a part of a group of 20 who were doing medical clinics and prayer walks in villages in northeastern Nigeria. One day, one of the girls on our team, a young girl, came to me and she said that she had a word from God. She had been reading through the Gospel of Luke and read a story about a little girl that had died and that Jesus had come on the scene to raise her from the dead. He was surrounded by people who were discouraging and mourning, and Jesus says to them, the little girl is not dead, she only is asleep. And this young girl on our team seized upon those words, and she said, I believe that the people here are discouraged and feel like the situation is hopeless because they're emphasizing how hard and difficult this work is, and that we need to change the narrative around what God is doing by reminding them that God had called us from a long distance to be a voice of encouragement for them. I seized upon that and felt like she was right, and so we set out to change the narrative. Not disagreeing that the work was hard and difficult, but always interjecting hope that God was up to something because he had spoken to us from a distance away to come and be a part of this work. It had a huge impact on the workers, and I'll share about that near the end of our message today. But a similar thing is happening in our text today, where the people of God were finding themselves in a season of discouragement. But it didn't start out that way. In verse 6 of our text, it says, So we rebuilt the wall till, uh, till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. 
The people were mobilized and they were motivated and they had momentum. They were halfway there and yet they were going to have some challenges that will set in. Nehemiah had successfully mobilized them to action though. In chapter 2 of Nehemiah, it says that Nehemiah said to them, You see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said. And they replied, Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. The people could sense the hand of God with Nehemiah, and they saw the abundance of resources that Nehemiah brought because of the king, and so they committed themselves to the work. And they reached the halfway point, and then something happened. It says in verse 7 and 8 of our text that Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed. They were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. When news reached about the progress that was being made, it stirred up opposition. It says that they were very angry and that they devised a scheme or a plot to cause the work to stop. Friends, here's one thing that we always need to take into consideration and we need to learn and expect, and that is that obedience to God will always stir up opposition. It always does. We live within a fallen world that has within it an antagonism towards God, an independence that is resident within the collection of humanity. And so there will always be opposition whenever God is at work. This is what the Apostle Paul learned. He told his protege Timothy this. He said, you know, however, all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That is a promise from God, not one that we like to lay hold of, but one that we need to take into consideration. That is, that when we commit ourselves to doing what God says, opposition occurs. It, it creates these various forms of opposition. The apostles were dealing with that in the early church as they talked with communities that were beginning to form and commit themselves to being the people of God in the world. Listen to what Paul told the Galatians. He says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. He talks about them having momentum. Things were going well. They were bearing fruit. They were making progress. And then something interfered. Something caused them to stumble. Something distracted them. Something knocked them off course. Something affected their pace. For the people in our story, there were a lot of things that interfered, and it came in waves. It says in verse 10, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. That word, meanwhile, paints a picture of what was happening. As they were dealing with a plot to destroy and distract the work of God, other things were happening, and it came in waves. The people in Judah said, the scriptures say. The Hebrew tone of the words is that it's a song or a, or a poem. You know how powerful songs and poetic words can be. They enter into our psyche. They become lodged in our memories. They shape our views and dispositions. How many of you have had a song in your mind that you just couldn't get out of it? These repeated words become mantras and shape the ways in which we see. We call this idea narrative. Narrative is a big picture story 
a theme, if you will, that helps us interpret everything else. Narratives are used by political campaigns. Narratives are used by marketing campaigns. These big picture narratives that affect how we view every event and situation. And so it is the people were singing a song, and it was a song of discouragement. It wasn't just one voice, though. There were three voices in our text that were causing discouragement. First, once again, is the voice of the people themselves. In verse 10, it says that the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. This was their mantra, and it was emphasizing their weaknesses, the enormity of the task, and the unbelief that they could even finish the work. It's amazing sometimes how these ideas of narratives of mantras that are negative become the controlling narratives of our life, shaping us and coloring how we read things and how we interpret things. This voice within themselves, this internal voice was discouraging and it was ignoring the good. It was ignoring the progress. It was ignoring the resources that they had at their disposal. There is so much rubble that voice was saying. Friends, when you think about it, they were trying to undo 150 years of damage. They were actually having to take the broken parts of that wall and take them out of the picture so that they could clear the space and build. This was not just a blank and clean slate. They had to wade through the brokenness. You know, when you think about it, Rome it was not built in a day, the old cliche goes. That if something took hundreds of years to accumulate and build up, you just can't solve it in a matter of days or months. So the voice of discouragement was an internal voice that was emphasizing weakness and the enormity of the task and an unbelieving idea that they could even do it. And, but then there was the voice of the enemy. In verse 11, it says that our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to their work. Here, this is a voice of doom and inevitability, of intimidation and taunting. This is a voice on the outside that is emphasizing that there is no hope for them for it will be destroyed no matter what they do. But then there was a voice of the people around them. In verse 12, it says that the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. This is the voice of people in the world, the surrounding spectating world, where this whisper campaign of the enemies was being reinforced through the, through the vocal cords of another 10 times, they said which is a way of just simply bombarding them by over-exaggerating the strength of the enemy. These three voices, the internal voice, the voice of the enemy, and the voice of the people around us are what many people have called over the history of the church the three great enemies of God's people, and that is the flesh, the world, and the devil the, the finiteness and the weakness of our own ability and our own ideas. The, the collection of the world with its values and all of the ways in which it seeks to uh, control and manipulate. And then the voice of the devil himself, that lying voice that accuses. These three are constantly seeking to distract us and to destroy us. Rick Warren says, that the environment of discouragement and feeling overwhelmed is really characterized by four Fs. There is fatigue, which is that we are tired and we just are not well rested. There is frustration, which is to say that we are impatient and we often are not submissive to the whole process and allow it to work out. We uh, have failed And that is that we make mistakes that we just can't forget or that we have fear where we become preoccupied with trying to control undesirable outcomes that threaten us. Those four Fs, fatigue, frustration, failure, and fear become fertile ground 
for discouragement to overwhelm us and cause us to consider quitting. Friends, these voices that come to the people are bombarding them with all kinds of reasons why they should stop doing the work. It's been said that our world is filled with sound. And those sounds can be divided in two categories that are noises and voices. Noises are those loud sounds that create distractions or call attention to something. They're loud, they're boisterous, they clamor. But voices are those soft ways, those whispers, those messages that seek to create emotional reactions and guide decision making. Noises and voices. Our world is filled with these kinds of sounds. A jambalaya of loud sounds and, and small whispers that make it difficult for us and cause us to yield to discouragement. In fact, we're bombarded daily by all forms of media that have narratives, large, big-picture ideas that they seek to interpret and color everything. These ideas that constantly remind us of what we lack, these ideal pictures of what it means to be beautiful or successful, these values that tend to shape us that compete with and contradict what we know to be the values of Scripture. It's these kind of big picture narratives that bombard us and create discouragement in our lives that cause us to throw our hands up in the air and just simply say, it's not worth it or I can't do it. Jesus understood that. Jesus says in John 10 to his people, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus challenges us about what noises and voices are shaping us. Are they robbing us of things? Are they attacking things in our life? Are they destroying the good? Or are they leading us to life and its abundance and its view of joy? Is it the voice of the good shepherd that is leading us and causing us to find rest and strength and devotion? Here in the midst of all of these voices, the internal voices, the songs that they're singing that are discouraging, these external voices of an enemy that seeks them harm, these, these repeating uh, voices that are simply being part of a whisper campaign to wear them down in the midst of all of them. Nehemiah speaks and he speaks the word of God. It says in verse 14, after I look these things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Nehemiah says to the people three things that break through the discouragement. And the first thing is, don't be afraid. Do not fear. This is the repeated command, the most repeated command in all of the scripture. And it's another way of saying, do not let fear rule your life. Do not let fear motivate your action or inaction. Do not let a preoccupation with trying to control the outcomes of life and trying to protect yourself from that which you do not like, do not let that dictate to you what you're going to do. A second thing that he says is not only do not fear, but remember the Lord. And he calls him the great and awesome God. What Nehemiah wants them to do is see that God is bigger than anything. That God is bigger than their work and their enemy. The apostle John says it this way, You dear children are from God and have overcome them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Friends, we need to have a right size picture of God. That God is bigger than our imagination. Bigger than anything that we could formulate. He is bigger than the work and he is bigger than the enemy. 
and that we need to understand the power of putting God into the equation of how we think about things. This is one of the reasons why every Sunday when we gather together here at Genesis Church, we receive Holy Communion because it reminds us, it calls us to remember what God has done. What God has done to rescue us from the enemies of our soul, sin and death. And that if God can rescue us from sin and God can rescue us from death, God can rescue us from anything. This becomes incredible good news for us to live by. So we need to do not fear and remember the Lord. And then fight. Fight for your families, he says. In other words, join in the battle. This is worth you fighting for. It's a call away from being people who are simply uh, people who are there for the good times, people who are there when the going is easy. This tells us to understand that if there's anything worthy to do in life, it costs us something and that it is worth fighting for. Listen to what Jesus says in John 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus was calling the people to see that they were committed or needed to be committed to the good welfare of the people. And this is what he calls the people to in Nehemiah as well. Fight for your families. Don't run away. Don't let discouragement dictate to you what you should do. Don't give up on the project. Don't isolate yourself away. Fight. Join the fight for it's worth it. And it says in verse 15 that when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. It doesn't tell us that the enemy retreated from their desires to destroy the work. We will see them show up again and again over the course of the story. But what it did do was it inspired the people to work in the midst of the fight. To understand that we live in a battle, a spiritual battle, if you will. And it began to equip them for the battle. It says in verse 16 and 17 that from that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officials posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other the people became equipped to know that the work that they were doing was incurring opposition and they shouldn't stop the work to deal with the opposition. They should do the work and deal with the opposition all at the same time. To work with one hand and hold a weapon in the other. In fact, there's a powerful way in which God uses opposition to strengthen their resolve to, in essence, bring about greater devotion in their lives. Jesus one day walked up to Peter, his favorite disciple, the one whom he had trusted with leadership. And in Luke 22, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as weed, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus understood that the devil was going to attack this guy, Simon, but that God was going to use it to bring strength and help him achieve the purpose for which he had called him to. Friends, in our text today, God calls a community to come together and join in the battle and the work at the same time. And it says in the latter part of verse 20, after he had called them to fight, it says this, our God will fight for us. When we give ourselves to God, God has our back. At the beginning of the message, I talked to you about changing the narrative, that the workers were very discouraged and negativity was coming out of their mouth. But at the end, as we shared in testimony time, one of the workers stood up and said, I have learned from you 
as God called you here, that this people, they are not dead, they're only asleep. And from this point on, I will not be overcome by how difficult the work is, but I will believe that God is at work doing incredible things. And that is the same for you and I, friends. When we give ourselves to obedience, we should expect opposition and challenges. We should expect discouragement to come. But God is there. And God cuts through all of those voices and leads us to the shepherd's voice, Jesus, who gives us life. May you hear his voice today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it for good, you turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Well, I hope that you have felt your soul elevated through this music and message. If you'd like more information on our ministries, you can visit our website, genesisfayetteville.com. And now, would you receive this blessing from Almighty God? Now may God, who so loved the world, including each of you, that he gave his only son, so now fill you with his spirit that you go forth and live in peace. Amen. Jesus,